Good afternoon, colleagues. National Finance, colleagues and members of the viewing public, the mandate of this committee is to examine matters relating to federal estimates generally as well as government finance. My name is Larry Smith, Senator from Quebec, and I chair the committee. Let me introduce briefly the other members of our group. To my left, Senator Andre Pratt. Welcome, Andre. To my right, Senator Salma Atuljan. To her right, from Nouveau Brunswick, the Nouveau Brunswick, Senator Percy Mockler. From Toronto, Senator Nicole Eaton. From The Rock, former Auditor General, a tiger in the tank, Senator <laughs> Beth Marshall. And of course, from Northern Ontario, Senator Bayak. Thank you. Welcome. This afternoon, we are continuing our study of Bill C-15, the Budget Implementation Bill for Budget 2016. C-15, we welcome and are pleased to have Dr. Jack Mintz, President, Fellow from the School of Public Policy, University of Calgary. During the second hour of our meeting, we will have officials from StatsCan and from Finance Canada on specific provisions of Bill C-15 related to the North, Northern Territories and uh, Nunavik and the Yukon. But first, Dr. Mintz, I know that you're very busy. We appreciate the fact that you've altered your schedule to spend some time with us. And could you give us some opening comments? Yes, thank you uh, very much, uh, Senator Smith, and it's a pleasure to be before the Finance Committee. In fact, I've been up uh, before the Banking, Trade, and Commerce Committee several times in the past year, so so it's nice to see a different group uh, as well. Um, I just, uh, first of all, want to uh, say a few remarks on Bill C-15, uh, which um, uh, I kind of look at as the uh, Campaign Implementation Act. Uh, of the government, which is uh, putting, uh, moving ahead on a number of promises that uh, were made during the campaign. And, uh, and I think you'll hear from my comments uh, that uh, some of them I actually support, uh, some of the things that are, are in Bill C-15, uh, C uh, some things I will uh, be critical of. Uh, and, uh, and probably, s since some of you know my views, you won't be surprised. Uh, I come with a very strong philosophy about uh, two issues uh, that are critical on when it comes to fiscal policy. Uh, one is that I do believe there's a certain important role that governments have uh, with respect to redistribution, with respect to encouraging growth, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and several other objectives, but those two particularly. Um, when it comes to taxation, I have a very strong belief uh, that uh, the tax system uh, should be fair, uh, fair in the sense that uh, taxes should be based on ability to pay, uh, where people with higher income should pay more relative to those with lower income. Uh, but I also strongly believe in keeping tax bases as neutral as possible, uh, for example, across different business activities, uh, and, and uh, try to keep rates as low as possible uh, in order to encourage uh, growth. Uh, and so uh, you'll see that some of my comments are very much based on, on this philosophy. With respect to deficits, I'm not a believer that you have to have balanced budgets every year. I think that what happened in 2008-9, it was absolutely necessary to go into deficit. And because there was a coordinated action amongst G20 countries to undertake fiscal stimulus, of which Canada did its uh, job very well, I was very strongly supportive of what we did in 2008 and 9, in order to counteract, was which was truly a global recession. But being around the table at finance, including the years of Paul Martin as Clifford Clark visiting economist in 1996 and 1997, I've also appreciated the tremendous work that both the Liberals and the Conservatives did from 1995 onwards uh, to put uh, Canada's fiscal uh, picture in much better balance. And in fact, if we had not done that, and the fiscal, the major crisis happened in, in 2008, as we as we saw, in terms of uh, the global crisis, uh, we would have had uh, a really bad uh, situation if we did not deal with our debt problem 
by running surpluses for over a decade. And I think that was quite appropriate. And so my view is that, yes, if you have a recession, you should think about running a deficit. But if you're, re you're in a period of growth, you don't need a deficit, and you should be looking towards having a balanced budget. And, and you'll see some of my comments uh, very quickly on a few items are, are, are addressed to that. First of all, I'd like to uh, say something about the small business uh, tax reduction. Uh, I have done quite a bit of work in this area, uh, especially with my colleague uh, Duanji Chen, uh, and also with another colleague, Phil Bazell. And what we had shown uh, in, in both of these, uh, in some work that we've done, is that first of all, uh, one of the problems with the current system uh, in taxation is that we penalize growth. If companies move from being small to larger, they lose tax benefits, and so effectively they see a wall of taxation, uh, which can impede their growth. And so I've been of the view that we should get rid of the small business deduction, but the best way of doing it actually is to actually lower the general rate. And in fact, uh, when I did the business tax review for Paul Martin back in 1997, we had actually recommended reducing the general rate, but keep the small business rate uh, the same. And we've done that at the federal level, moving the general rate to 15%, and the small business rate was 11%. The four-point difference wasn't too large. I would get rid of it entirely, but uh, that uh, wasn't a bad, a bad move. I do have very significant concerns at the provincial level. So when both uh, parties recommended going to 9% during campaign, I can tell you I was not in favor of that. Uh, I don't think moving to a 9% rate is really the appropriate thing to do uh, with respect to the small business deduction. Uh, in fact, if, uh, if I was having my druthers, I would look at the UK system. United Kingdom had a 30% corporate income tax rate, which they've now moved to 20%. The, the small business rate was 19%. Now they have a 20% rate, so there's no difference now between small and large firms. And as we know, the United Kingdom is moving to a 17% corporate income tax rate uh, over the next few years. Uh, what they've done is they brought in a, a different incentive for small businesses which is to provide expensing up to 750 million pounds. And to me, that's actually a much better way of approaching uh, incentives for small business. Even if they grow larger, they still have that expensing. And if you give 700, you know, let's say a million dollars expensing to a Canadian firm that's very large, it doesn't mean a lot to them, uh, but it means a lot to small businesses. And so those are the kinds of incentives we should be thinking about. I also have some other comments that uh, I won't hold on or go on further about other incentives, but we should be looking at better incentives uh, in the small business case. So I didn't have a problem with the budget holding the small business tax rate at 10.5% uh, as it did. Uh, secondly, on the labor-sponsored venture capital credit, uh, there has been numerous studies that have shown this has been a credit that's not only ineffective, but actually has harmed venture capital markets in Canada. And the reason for that is that it ended up attracting a lot of poor investments with very low rates of return. In fact, the uh, one time when I was looking at the statistics, the average rate of return on venture capital with labor-sponsored venture capital credits uh, was only 3% uh, rate of return, while in the United States it was more like uh, 16 to 19%. So if I was a pension fund looking at investing in Canada in a venture capital fund, versus the uh, uh, United States, uh, it's very obvious which one I'm gonna choose. I'm gonna choose the American for sure. And, and, and so I think we really need to make sure that we have the appropriate incentives and, and exact, the, the wrong one to have was the labor-sponsored venture capital credit. So I was most disappointed that the budget reintroduced it and even inter introduced it in a way where it's only gonna parallel those provinces that have the the venture capital credit today, which I think is even more bizarre, where we're, we're setting up balkanization in the province at the federal level, amongst the provinces uh, at the federal level. Another uh, issue that came up uh, in the budget uh, was moving to uh, moving the old age security um, uh, eligibility age from uh, 67 back to 65. Uh, I think that was a, a very important move that the previous government did. I think it was the right thing to do. People are living a lot longer today uh, and are in long, much longer periods of retirement. Uh, when you go back to uh, when uh, old age security was introduced in the early 50s, uh, the age of eligibility was actually 70, but people actually, the expected life, was, uh, life of people was actually below 70 uh, at that time. Uh, back in the uh, mid-1960s, we 
uh, lowered the age of eligibility to 65, but generally people, people, men and women, lived somewhere between 72 to 74 years of age on average. Uh, but of course, nowadays, we're into the, into, uh, the 80s. And most countries around the world have been increasing uh, their age of eligibility, uh, have been going to higher levels. For example, in Holland, uh, they actually now have a policy where the age of eligibility is indexed to the uh, uh, lifetime of people. So the longer people are going to live, the age of eligibility will be automatically indexed uh, in, in, in Holland. This is what they now do. Uh, and a number of countries, including the United States, has gone, have gone to 67 years of age uh, for, for their Social Security uh, system. Uh, so we, th it was exactly the appropriate thing to do because we do need to worry about our aging society and the kind of fiscal requirements that could be needed to support people. And, and uh, I think this was a retrograde step uh, in the budget by reversing uh, the age of eligibility going from 67 to 65, which will put on more pressure on governments in the future uh, as a result of that change. Um, the final one which I'd uh, like to talk about is the tax package, uh, which really had two major parts. One was the child tax plan. Uh, which did simplify things to a certain extent with one program as opposed to two, uh, and it also had a, uh, a cla um, it also uh, had a, a middle class tax uh, cut, uh, but raising the top rate four points. Uh, in the case of the child tax plan, uh, there are some elements I liked, and I think it was appropriate to try to simplify it uh, into one program. Uh, I think that uh, we have to remember that it did increase marginal tax rates for families with more than $45,000 in income because the, because the benefits are clawed back uh, after that income level up to, uh, I believe was, I forget now the, the, the limit uh, on that, but it was, uh, it raises the marginal tax rates uh, actually in those cases. Um, it also got rid of income splitting, and I'll come back to that in, in a moment, um, uh, but also it raised the top rate four points, which I think has, uh, a, a, was a major mistake, I think, in public policy terms uh, for Canada. The average top rate now in Canada, including the provincial rates, is 53%. And uh, that is actually now the fourth highest amongst OECD countries. Uh, we're just a little bit below France, uh, and we're below, I think it's Denmark and Sweden. Uh, I don't think it really does us a favor to be at sub top level, especially relative to the United States, where we're trying to attract talent. And, and I have already know that there's a number of businesses that have been finding that uh, the combination of the low dollar with the uh, higher marginal tax rates uh, is having an impact on their ability to recruit people here. But it also affects young people who are looking to be entrepreneurs and doing well in the future, and they look at this much more uh, uh, graduated system, which I think does have an impact. Uh, that is one negative aspect with the top rate at 53%. Uh, the other negative impact is that uh, both the increased marginal tax rates under the child tax plan, uh, as well as the higher marginal tax rate for high income individual, uh, will discourage savings. And, and I think this is uh, it, because people on their investment dollars uh, they might earn a measly uh, rate of return of 4 or 5%. Uh, this is uh, without taking into account inflation. Uh, but if you're paying marginal tax rates of 40 to 50%, uh, in, in which actually is quite possible even for the middle class with, with children, uh, then, then you, you actually are going to be very discouraged to put money into savings uh, because of uh, the fact that your after-tax return is going to be reduced to about 2.5%, subtract off long-term inflation of 2%, that's hardly giving you much of a real after-tax return uh, on your savings. And here we're worried about trying to encourage people to save uh, for the future, uh, for their retirement purposes, and we've had a very good system in place. And in fact, uh, combined uh, with these higher marginal tax rates, as well as reducing the, uh, the limit for tax-free savings accounts from 11,000 to uh, 5,500, it's, it's going to have a significant impact on increasing the tax on savings for many middle-income individuals. And, you know, there's been a lot of seniors that took advantage of the, of the TFSA uh, because it allowed them to shift uh, assets that were being taxable uh, into tax-free savings, and that allows them to accumulate uh, wealth more quickly for their retirement purposes or even during retirement 
uh, w when they have some money to help support themselves. Uh, so I think that's been a, uh, a retrograde step. The other issue is I think is, uh, well, I think the middle class tax cut was a good thing. And of course, I, because it goes for the opposite reason, is that it does provide some, in, some incentive for more work, risk taking, et cetera, uh, for the people least earning between Forty-five and, and ninety thousand uh, dollars. We have to remember where we, we have to ask the question: Really, what do we mean by middle class? Uh, and I would call that more the more the uh, bottom half of the middle class. Uh, but I think there's also another issue that I think is uh, needs to get more analysis and, and more discussion on the table. And that is, we have to remember there are different people uh, or families with different size and circumstances. Uh, so, for example, if uh, you have two teachers in Toronto uh, that are earning roughly $85,000 each, that's $170,000 in family income. Is that middle class or not? Under the tax cut, the middle tax, tax cut, $45,000 to $90,000 for individual income, which, which that applies to, uh, you would say that, yes, they are both middle class individuals. And of course, uh, as many of us know, if you own a house in Toronto, it's quite a challenge, I think, to deal with that. Um, however, what happens when you have a single earner who's earning $180,000 and, uh, and has a spouse who's staying at home, which these days could be male or female, uh, and, and raising a couple of kids, and they want to, uh, young kids, and they feel that it's very important for one person to stay at home to, to, uh, you know, to, to raise their family. Uh, is $180,000 in that case uh, not middle class? Uh, when you have uh, two earners, or one earner and a, and a family of, of two uh, children and a, and a spouse, uh, I would argue, yes, they are middle class as well. And yet the income splitting uh, that has been removed under this budget uh, discriminates very much as the numbers that I've calculated in the past against uh, households where a single earner tries to stay at home and raise their children. And I think that has some negative impacts as well. So I'll stop there, uh, Senator. Thank you very much. Uh, you've given us uh, many, many issues that we can ask you questions on uh, in terms of redistribution, taxation, the ability to pay, deficits, uh, good and bad, uh, lowering the general tax rate, uh, the combination of uh, uh, small business and large business tax rates, a UK model, uh, labor-sponsored uh, venture capital, uh, old age uh, reduction of age from 67 to 65, the child tax uh, good move that you said, top tax rate at 53%, uh, TFSA reduction, definition of middle class, size of family, location, and what what it really means to earn income in terms of where you're classified. So with all of the points that you shared with us, we have some senators who are anxious to ask you some questions, Dr. Senator Eaton, Toronto. Thank you, Mr. Mintz. Um, is flat tax not feasible? Is that why nobody wants to go to something simple like a flat tax? Well, it depends what you mean by a flat tax. Well, instead <laughs> of uh, it having a graduated income tax, depending on your income. No, no, I know that. No, let me let me explain why. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the flat tax proposals usually are like when it was once in Alberta. Uh, was, let's say, a 10% tax rate, so it was called a flat tax. However, it had a very significant exemption level, uh, which was $17,000 per individual. Now, if you, um, if you ask the question, is that really a flat tax, I would say it isn't, because it's really two rates. It's zero and 10%, because there's zero applied to the first $17,000. So when people talk about flat taxes, my view, there is no flat tax that anyone is really discussing. Because, uh, because what they're saying is a less graduated system. Now, uh, if you look at the Canadian tax system today, uh, we have so many different marginal tax rates that, uh, that are involved because it's not just the official rates that are under the Income Tax Act, uh, which is you know, uh, like 15% and 20.5% uh, now and uh, 26 and, and 33. Uh, 29.33, uh, but it's also all these clawback rates that people face. Uh, so, for example, if you're a senior and you're getting guaranteed income supplements, there's a 50% marginal tax rate that's added on for that individual because of the clawback. If you're getting old age security, 
there's a 15% marginal tax rate added on between the income of 70,000 and roughly 110,000 as the clawback goes for the old age security. So we have a whole plethora of these different marginal tax rates uh, that are sitting in the system. And I think some people are getting to the point, well, maybe we should start trying to integrate these things. And the most, you know, the, the one concept that people have been talking about is going to, let's say, a minimum, you know, uh, level of income uh, where, where you, you know, the government gives a grant and, uh, and it could be taxable. Uh, but, uh, but effectively, it's a minimum grant, and try to unroll some of all these various programs with all these different marginal tax rates. Certainly, I've argued in the past that we should try to put a basket of these different incomes together and have joint, uh, you know, have one clawback rate that would apply to different benefits. So you can also get rid of some of these things that stack up, because sometimes they can stack up to close to 100% or even more in terms of marginal tax rates. But why wouldn't we have something I mean, I guess I've listened to too many political speeches on both sides of the border. Why wouldn't we have something simple like a guaranteed annual income that, you know, you guaranteed? So there was no clawback, there was no extras, you just got a guaranteed income, and then a flat tax for people who fell above the guaranteed income. Yeah. Okay, so that was the Milton Friedman proposal, uh, which has never been fully adopted. The, the public finance literature would probably argue that uh, against that for, for, at least it wouldn't be as simple as you'd think. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, there's a concept of tagging, that, uh, that uh, sometimes it will be more efficient and less costly if you can vary uh, your support based on certain characteristics of individuals. So for example, if you're disabled, you may want to give more money to a disabled person compared to somebody who's not disabled. Uh, and, and so there may be, uh, you know, if you have a family of four, there's a big difference between that and a family of two uh, in terms of support, et cetera. So there is an argument for having some differentiation uh, and that it's not as simple as the way that Milton Friedman had, had originally characterized it. Uh, but certainly you can ask the question whether maybe we, what I find what's intriguing about the concept is perhaps undoing some of the tremendous bureaucracies that have been built up, uh, providing various programs, uh, which I think unemployment insurance, or what we call in Canada employment insurance, to give it a good spin, uh, is uh, is actually uh, has it is a it is a very complicated uh, system with a huge bureaucracy, where we try to identify different unemployment regions and different rates and different benefits. I mean, it is bizarre. I mean, I think if you came from Mars, and you'd look at this, and you'd say, "This is absolutely the, the screwiest system uh, that could be developed by a, by a country uh, in terms of dealing with that." And if you had a minimum uh, guaranteed income, you could actually probably get rid of the whole unemployment insurance system uh, as a result. So, and and that could actually have very significant benefits in increasing the incentive to work. In fact, there are studies that have shown that Canada's unemployment rate is about a point higher. Uh, because of our employment insurance system. That was from the past, the changes that were made in 1994 uh, on, when uh, under the Krejcian government and the later changes that were made under the Harper government had reduced some of the cost of that unemployment insurance system that we have in Canada. But from what I understand now, to many in many things we've actually backtracked uh, and, and that's actually going to impose uh, uh, significant costs on the Canadian economy uh, as well as undermine incentives for work. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thank you very much, Senator Eaton. We have a full list, so I ask all our senators to be prompt with their questions. Senator Marshall. Yes, Chair. There's um, one area that I don't think you mentioned in your opening remarks, but I would appreciate any comments you might have on it because it's in the it's in the news again today, and that's enhancing uh, CPP. And uh, so, um, could, could you give us your comments on that? Do you see that as a tax on small business? Is it something you think the, um, you know, the, the um, I guess people at the lower end of the salary scale will be now required to uh, contribute additional premiums, uh, and that will have an impact on their take-home pay? So, if you could just speak a little bit about that issue that's currently in the news. Okay, so, so the question is, what's the problem? <laughs> And, and this has been the problem around CPP expansion. And uh, I was asked by the, the Federal Provincial Territorial Ministers of Finance to be the director of a research project to basically put data together in 2009 to assess whether we had a pension crisis in this country. 
that report actually uh, and the studies that were done under it uh, by various uh, top academics in Canada as well as the OECD was that the overall picture you got was you got from that uh, from that work was that 80% of Canadians were doing perfectly fine. We had a financially sustainable program uh, of support for retirement and that there was no major problem, but there were a couple of pockets of areas of, of concern. Uh, one of them being the, you know, what I call the modest uh, income individuals, which are roughly twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars in income, where uh, where there were some people that had a drop in income support that was quite significant. In some later work that I did uh, uh, on seniors, I actually found that the poverty rate for single seniors was much higher uh, than for uh, two, you know, two singles or two seniors living together. And in fact, uh, the, for, for two seniors living together, the poverty rate uh, for seniors is below 5%. Uh, 5%. But when you have uh, just a single senior on their own, uh, the poverty rate that we estimated taking the most conservative line of uh, Statistics Canada uh, poverty line was that we found that the, the, um, the poverty rate was 20%. So I had argued that we should top up the guaranteed income supplement, which this last budget did, and I fully support what they did um, in, in the current budget. Um, but I also would argue if I was doing anything on CPP expansion, I would actually go to, from 60% survivor benefits to 100% survivor benefits, because 70% of the single seniors are women who, first of all, could work part of the years you know, during their life. Uh, but uh, but but also went through marriage breakdowns and other other things like that. But we're actually below the poverty line, and and so I think I, I think going to 100% survivor benefits would be useful because when your when your partner dies, uh, you lose the an old age security payment and you lose some of the CPP benefits of that partner. And that, you know it may be ten thousand dollars, but when you're dropping from thirty five thousand dollars in family income to twenty five thousand, which is a lot of people in that in that group. It really has uh, it has an impact. So the, the, I would support I would support a very targeted approach on CPP. The the pro what really is happening now is that the provinces um, there, well there's a movement on foot to try to kill off the Ontario retirement um, sorry yeah the, uh, Ontario retirement pension plan the ORPP. It is highly distortive. It balkanizes the Canadian labour market and pension markets. It also balkanizes the labor market in Ontario because you're going to have firms that are exempt because they have their own, they have a rich enough defined contribution plan uh, or they have their own defined uh, benefit plan and then you have others that don't and then you're going to have people moving in between and also firms may make decisions like saying, well, maybe if I'm, maybe I'll get rid of my defined benefit plan or my defined contribution plan and, and it'll be cheaper if, if my, my employees are on the ORPP. It's, it is a terrible idea, the ORPP. One of the biggest mistakes I've seen in public policy in years. And, um, and so there's now an attempt to try to get a CPP expansion to try to kill off the ORPP. The bigger question is that what about 62% of the rest of the country? Do they need a CPP expansion? And the recent studies that have been done by uh, McKinsey and as well as Statistics Canada have shown that the numbers that we found in 2009 in terms of which part of the population are threatened hasn't changed at all. In other words, despite all the things that have happened since 2008, uh, again, roughly four-fifths of Canadians are doing perfectly fine and don't need CPP expansion. So if you're a young person who wants to buy a house, which by the way is, a, is the most important retirement asset in Canada, is, your, is housing equity, and you want to buy a house and raise a family, and now all of a sudden you have to pay more CPP, well, this, you know, you're actually making it that much more difficult for that young family to buy a house. And I think we need to think very carefully about what we're doing to the population. As far as the employment effects of, of uh, payroll taxes on businesses, in the short run, it could have some negative response. The longer run, less negative, because you can get wage. What, what, what you actually find is that pay, uh, what studies have shown is that payroll taxes on employers tend to get shifted back on employees in terms of lower wages. So in the end, the employees end up paying, which again makes it harder for younger families. So I, I would actually argue that uh, I'm not sure that even a, a you know unless it's a very targeted approach on CPP expansion, I think would be a big mistake for us to move ahead with that. So you're saying if it's not broke, don't fix it. 
and exactly. for, the, for the pocketed areas that that's what you would look at. Do I have time for another question? Um, if you could be patient, we're going to get you on round two. Okay. okay. Senator, Thank you. Senator I'll try to keep my answer short, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. And Thank you for all your exceptional work over years. You're so respected. It's an honor to have you here. You. I appreciated your remarks as a small business owner in the past in Ontario. The um, pension plan idea is terrible. Every business person that contacts me tells me it's going to hurt their bottom line, hurt their hiring, hurt, hurt their competition on the world stage. I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit on income splitting. Everyone at this table understands it very well from the past government and why this government's taken away. The average couple at home doesn't really even understand what it's going to mean to them and your expertise would be much appreciated. Well, uh, so the idea of income splitting was to uh, allow, uh, if it was what I would call an, a partial approach to what you might call family taxation. Uh, the most, you know, like the, the most general approach is something like what France does, where they, where the family, all the income is aggregated in the family, and you divide by a divisor, uh, and the divisor is usually um, one for each adult, uh, plus a half for the first two kids, and then one for the third kid. So, if it's a family of five, then the divisor would be uh, four. So you take the income divided by four, you apply the progressive rate schedule to that. And then you multiply by four, and that's the tax paid by the family. It doesn't matter who has the income within the family. You, you don't need income attribution rules. It's actually there's a lot of you know there's a lot of simplification you actually get with that approach as well. And it's also very fair in in my view. And of course, the United States has uh, joint filing uh, for families. So I looked at the income splitting uh, proposal we had in Canada, uh, where people could designate up to fifty thousand dollars. As a, as a partial way of, of achieving income splitting, and of course only applied for uh, for families uh, with uh, with with children. Uh, and in fact, I think actually that's not bad because I think one of the most important decisions made by a family about whether people want to work or not is 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 whether they're raising especially children when they're young. And, and there's a lot of families that uh, would, you know, where they would like to have uh, one of the one of the uh, two parents being at home to raise that family. So uh, I think the income splitting thing was actually very fair uh, and in, in that sense. In fact, more fair than pension income splitting, uh, uh, to be frank. Uh, so I think that uh, it made a lot of sense. Uh, unfortunately, and, I, and I'm really quite uh, uh, disappointed in some of the think tanks that came out with criticisms of income splitting, that it's only for a certain number of families and and uh, you know, and it's and it's a bonus to higher income families. Uh, that's not necessarily true. In fact, it was a big bonus to many be uh, many families. In fact, to give an example: if you had, let's say, two two individuals working, uh, and one was, uh, you know, fully working, but one goes on maternity leaves and their income drops. Let's say, one's a t you know, let's say one's a police person and one's a, a teacher. Um, so they're earning roughly eighty, ninety thousand dollars each. But then, one goes on maternity leave and ha goes down to forty thousand. You know, getting support in the EI. Actually, income splitting was was helpful to them during that period, and and it was capped to two thousand dollars. So, in my view, is uh, you know, it, it was actually uh, not a bad proposal uh, to at least have some family taxation in, in Canada. So, getting rid of it still does, in my view, does not help. Uh, in fact, I think it's harmful uh, in that it still makes it more difficult for those families that want to have one parent staying at home uh, to raise their children. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is uh, Senator Andre Pratt. Yes, um, Mr. Mintz, you, uh, you uh, wrote, uh, uh, you, you said now t today, and you wrote also about your concerns uh, about uh, debt, Canada's debt. Uh, especially after the, the last budget, and um, yet, uh, I, and I'm concerned also, but yet I noticed that, for instance, the IMF applauded the, the last budget and uh, showing that Canada uh, is pointing the way by using its deficits because of its uh, uh, positive uh, 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 financial position. I noticed also that in, in an article that you published in the Financial Post, you, there was a sh there was a table there where you showed uh, Canada's total debt, where there's a government debt and a private debt, and the corporate debt. 
And in fact, the culprit. Well, intermediary. I'm sorry? Oh, intermediary. Intermediary, yeah. which is non financial we'll, sector. We'll broader financial. than just corporate. Yes. And, and uh, the culprit, really, of the total debt is really the intermediary debt, which really has increased uh, considerably. So there are two questions in that question, really. Number one, if, if it's true that our debt is so. Is so uh, uh, is so grave, why is it that the IMF, which is usually quite conservative, uh, is applauding us, is applauding us and applauding us? And second, uh, is, is really government debt the problem or more intermediary debt? Well, first of all, uh, uh, I don't agree with the IMF. I think they were wrong in, in their assessment. Uh, but I don't, let me put it this way, Canada is not as bad as some other countries, so maybe they're just looking at what other countries and the position is in right now and thinking that Canada has more fiscal room. My, my problem right now is that Canada's growth rate is somewhere between 1 and 2 percent. It's actually getting closer to 2, and with the lower dollar, I think we'll be roughly in the 2 percent range next year. Um, our productivity growth rate is only 1 percent, and our population growth rate is only 1 percent. You're not going to get much better than 2% as a growth rate for a country. So we're kind of, I don't see us in a recession and I don't see us having a significant problem. However, what I do see is that just taking public gross liabilities, uh, and this is Statistics Canada measure, it's now hit 116% of GDP. Some of us will remember the bad time of 1994 when the IMF almost pulled the, you know, pulled the rug under Canada. Our, our, our uh, gross li public gross liabilities as a percent of GDP was 135%. We're not up to that yet, but if you go back to 19, uh, 2007, we were close to 80%. So we're kind of halfway there now. And, and that my bigger concern is where we're going in the future. If you look at corporate debt, the lowest point of uh, corporate debt or one of the best positions we were was in 2007. In fact, you know, leverage wasn't very high in Canada except for uh, banking debt, but because of our capital requirements in Canada, our bank, our bank leverage wasn't too bad either, uh, relative to a lot of other countries. That's where the intermediary comes in, because it's the bank debt that's really important. Uh, but we've gone up there uh, quite a bit. And, and then if you look at household debt, we know that the household debt, at least as a share of disposable income, has now reached 165%. Back in 2007, it was about 30 points less. So, you know, we, we, we're now kind of turning the corner. We're going back to the old days. And what I'm concerned about is I don't see the federal government needing to run a big deficit. I can understand a deficit in Alberta and Saskatchewan and Newfoundland at this point in time. And I can understand uh, a deficit um, maybe in, uh, in, in a few provinces where they're having some difficulty. Uh, but the federal government did not need to run, in my view, a large deficit. Uh, that is 1.5% of GDP. If it's 30 billion this coming year, we'll see what it finally ends up to be uh, at the federal level. But we have to remember the provinces are also running deficits in general. And, uh, and in fact, uh, if you add in the provincial deficits, you're roughly at over 3% of GDP. Uh, and especially if you, if you look at the increase in net debt, it's, it's over 3% of GDP, GDP because um, because because of capital, because deficits are measured without cap, um, without capital sp spending. In other words, they depreciate capital, and if you have a lot of debt going into capital spending, then that doesn't get included in the in the definition of, of a deficit uh, at the at, 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 in the public deficit. And um, and so when you start looking at net debt increases, it's over three percent of GDP. That's actually higher than what the Maastricht Treaty uh, limit would have been. Uh, back in the 1990s in the European Union. So, so we're, we're, in my view, we're going into dangerous territory. Because what happens if we do run a recession, and we, we will run much bigger deficits as a result, I, I, I think we have to be very careful not to undermine our position. The other thing which I find very disappointing is that actually the way that net debt is calculated uh, in Canada uh, and some countries I think is problematical. Because uh, the way that net debt is calculated is that you take, um, you take uh, uh, gross asset uh, debt and you subtract off financial assets. Uh, and that seems appropriate to think of net debt in that way. We subtract off uh, the Canada Pension Plan and the Quebec Pension Plan assets. But if you look at the calculations of net debt, 
we do not include the future liabilities associated with those pension payments. In other words, we just add in the assets of CPP and QPP minus the current payouts this, of this year for pension liabilities, but not future pension liabilities. And, and in other words, we're adding all, all those assets sitting in Social Security are getting subtracted from our net debt, and we're ignoring a huge liability that's associated with, with that pension uh, liability in the future. Uh, because uh, those assets are really promises to pay pensions under the Canada Pension Plan and the QPP. So uh, I, think we are, I think we have to be very careful with these net debt calculations in terms of what they really mean. Uh, and so if you take out Social Security surplus assets, uh, you'll find that actually, uh, you'll find that actually you, you have a much higher net debt as a share of GDP in Canada instead of being uh, at the federal level right now, it's around 35% or 31%, whatever the number is. Um, and the provincial one, uh, you have to, it gets up to 60%, but when you start getting the net debt numbers, you start getting up closer to 80%. So it's, much, it's a much grimmer calc uh, situation than one thinks. Not as bad as many other countries after 2009 in the industrialized countries, but something that I don't think we should just sit back on our laurels and, and keep patting ourselves on the back that we did a great job, which we did. But I mean, I'm worried we're backtracking. Thank you. Senator Atulajan. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question to you is that there was a lot of talk about uh, restoring hope for the middle class. Um, there are many different definitions of uh, middle class. So with your great knowledge and experience, um, who would you define as middle class? Well, I think the public looks at themselves. Everybody is middle class. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, uh, economists, you know, will have different definitions, but usually you look at the median income level, and then you might say, well, we'll, we'll calculate middle class as some, uh, putting, thinking of it in statistical, in statistical terms, some, you know, standard deviation, one or two from the mean, median. And so that would be what you might think of as middle class. So in other words, you might say if the um, average family or the median family income is roughly, I forget the exact number now, but let's say $60,000 uh, in Canada, you might say, well, middle class is you know, 30000 to 90000 And it captures a you know, fair portion of the population. Um, but one of the problems I have with this is, goes back to my comments about income splitting, is what do we mean by middle class when you have families of different size and, and, and different requirements? And of course, there are also people that are disabled that may have certain costs that, you know, uh, that are, are higher than, than people who are not disabled. And of course, you have a different cost of living in some areas of the country compared to others. Of course, everyone will talk about Toronto and Vancouver housing prices. Uh, for people that are in a house, that's not an issue. Uh, but for people that are trying to buy a house, it is. But if you're living in the north, you have a higher cost of living uh, because of the cost of food and, and a number of things because of the high transportation costs uh, are, are more expensive uh, in the north than you would find in the south. And so that will also affect, I think, your definition of what you mean by middle class. Thank you, Chair. Second round, Senator Marshall and uh, Senator Eaton, do you want to be on that second round? Oh, oh, yes, there's so much I could, yeah. yeah. And Senator Marshall. So let's uh, maybe go to Senator Montar, give him a chance, and then we go right to you, Senator Marshall, followed by Senator Eaton. Uh, you once wrote an article. Uh, Boy, I'm really getting quoted today. <laughs> it's dangerous to write sometimes. We're, we're watching you. <laughs> About a smart tax and regulatory policies. Uh, would you expand a bit on that? Sorry, what was the in smart? In Ireland, a smart tax and the, uh, we call it the Irish miracle. Oh, okay. Uh, in the 90s, and we see that there seems to be a propelling to back to where it was. Okay, uh, so Ireland, uh, it's, a, it's actually a wonderful story of, uh, for tax policy experts like myself, uh, because it shows you taxes can have pretty powerful impact. Uh, as many people know, Ireland was a basket case for centuries, really, uh, in, in Europe, uh, really one of the poor areas of, um, poor countries of, of Europe. And it was back in the late 1960s that uh, they decided to undertake a very significant change in the way they um, 
they did things because they were always losing population to Europe and, and America, uh, and uh, you know they, you know they had a poor, uh, you know, poor education uh, as well. Uh, in fact, not only did people not go into uh, tertiary education, but they didn't even go into secondary education. Uh, so what the Irish did was really had a three-pronged strategy. Uh, one was. Uh, actually invest in education. In fact, they started free tuition for uh, tertiary education because they wanted to really encourage uh, people to get beyond the secondary stage and into universities and colleges. Uh, but, they, uh, but they also, they really try to get their population educated uh, and create a lot more skilled workers. But of course, they also understood that if you're going to have skilled workers, you have to create demand for those skilled workers or else they'll go off to other countries. And so what they did is they, they had two policies to try to attract businesses uh, to Ireland and to create jobs. One was infrastructure spending to improve the infrastructure in Ireland. Uh, and, the, and the other was a very significant adjustment to its tax system, uh, particularly its income taxes, much lower rates, broader basis uh, type of thing. But the, but the key was their much lower corporate income tax rate uh, that they lowered uh, for manufacturing and financial income to 10% initially, and then later undertook a broadening where they made it 12.5% for everything. Um, and that did attract a lot of multinationals to Ireland uh, after the late 1960s. And so by the time he hit uh, 2000, the year 2000, Ireland was actually getting a migration inflow, not an outflow anymore. Uh, it was the fastest growing European country uh, for uh, roughly two decades. Uh, and it also, um, it, it also uh, had a huge improvement in productivity uh, as, as a result. The big mistake Ireland did was they really messed up the financial regulatory system. <laughs> they were not very careful. I remember when I was in Ireland and, and a cab driver was telling me that he could get a mortgage equal to 125% of the value of his house. In other words, buy furniture and, <laughs> and all the other things. And, uh, and so Ireland got very heavily hit by the financial crisis in 2009. Uh, and it, um, you know, it had to uh, save uh, banks that went, got into serious trouble. Uh, the economy itself uh, took a big hit. It had a major recession. Uh, much bigger than what we had in Canada and in Australia, uh, and but it uh, it really did pay the price of bad financial regulation at that time. Uh, but it's interesting that the past couple of years now, Ireland has now become one of the fastest growing European countries again. It's not quite at six percent average growth rates or seven that it was uh, before, but it's in the three to four percent range, which is better than, of course, what we're doing in North America and in many other countries. So. And a lot of that is because some of the main, main policies that they had earlier on are still in place today and, and are still playing a significant role in, in helping the country. Do you have a short one? Yes, a short one. Would you comment on uh, guaranteed annual income for, uh, for uh, I did. I did say a few earlier remarks and yeah. I could spend a little bit more time. I think it's an intriguing idea if we can cut down some of the complexity in our system. Uh, but I don't think that it, uh, the pure system of a single minimum income will work because there are too many differential needs of families. Again, going back, there's, there's, situa there's a difference between dis disability, uh, uh, there's families with uh, different size families with different size children, you know, number of children, things like that. So you won't have, you know, just a, you're, you're going to have to have differentiation in your support systems. But it would be. But the one thing is that you end up clawing back all the benefits at the same rate if you did have a clawback, uh, and uh, and it maybe you could get rid of employment insurance because it may not be needed and all the bureaucracy associated with that. Thank you. Uh, Let's move on to a second round, Senator Marshall. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I wanted to uh, follow up on uh, Senator uh, Tulajan's question about growing the middle class. And uh, we've discussed this on numerous occasions in, in this committee with various witnesses. And it, it starts with, of course, the budget where it says growing the middle class. So we were trying to define the middle class so this time next year we could go back and see if the middle class actually did grow. 
Um, so it, your 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 suggestion was probably the closest. I think we've come to being, you know, fairly definitive. So would you have any suggestions as to how we could next year go back to see if the middle class actually did grow as a result of the uh, changes uh, in the budget? <laughs> I think you have a tough time because <laughs> uh, usually there's a lag of data, right? <laughs> right. It's more than a year. <laughs> and yeah. So you're not even going to be able to assess it that easily. Um, you know, for example, economists will predict that the increase in the top rate uh, you know, uh, as we did in the latest, the latest budget, as well as some of the provinces did, I, yes, Alberta, right. yeah. for example, uh, which has gone nine points in total, we won't know for three or four years what implications that had to personal income tax uh, mm -hmm. uh, collections in Alberta, uh, because it's going to take that long to get the data to, to really understand that, um, uh, at least if it's public data. Now, maybe government can assess that more quickly, but I doubt they'll even know that next year Even, uh, okay. by the time yes. Canada Revenue Agency yes. is able to put everything together. Okay. Because in the budget, yeah. it also talked about making evidence-based decisions. So what you're saying is that evidence won't be collected for four or five years down the road. Yeah, it, or maybe two to three. Or maybe know, two it, to it, three. Depending on what kind of information. Right. But uh, right. I think the key is uh, statistics Canada does do surveying and they do show what's happening to people's incomes. And I think the only thing that you can judge is you know, are, are, are family incomes growing, uh, right. individual incomes? Uh, are people better off in two to three years? But the problem there is that there's confounding factors that will influence that growth. It's not just going to be the budget and the provisions in the budget. There's other things that are happening, including what's happening worldwide, uh, you know, such as the price of oil or interest rates or, or whatever. All those things will, will uh, impact on growth in the country. Uh, and so then you get in this debate, well, maybe if we didn't do these measures, you know, uh, uh, you know, it would have been worse or it would have been would better, have you know, who knows. Uh, but but that's, that's, that's the problem in trying to do that analysis. And to do that kind of analysis, which is possible, you need data for a long Multiple enough period years. to make, to, to, to understand it. periods, okay. Um, could you just, um, in the context of your comments on the deficit and where we're going in the long term, uh, there's quite a bit of infrastructure spending, well, quite a bit of spending in this year's budget um, uh, giving rise to the deficit. Um, and some has been categorized as stimulus spending. W would it not have been better for the government to have given further tax breaks rather than, you know, revving up the spending? Like, would you have any comments on that? I'm surprised that you didn't quote my op-ed recently. <laughs> actually, you, tax, you an opportunity tax, cuts, uh, tax cuts actually work much faster yes. uh, than infrastructure spending. In fact, uh, even during the 2008-09 uh, period, I know that... Um, Minister Flaherty was really adamant about use it or lose it, yeah. and you, you know, so we were, we were looking at infrastructure spending that would be done, uh, like filling potholes, it could be done right away, as opposed to big infrastructure projects right. that uh, might be needed, but will take much longer period to be done. I actually think infrastructure is a lousy way to stimulate the economy, okay. except for filling some potholes at a certain point in time. Uh, it's, it's because I think what infrastructure is important for is building capacity to produce goods and, f and services in the future. And and that's more of a long-term type investment. And, and, and it's important for the productivity of the country that there's sufficient public and private infrastructure spending, both, has to, has to be done. And, and in fact, uh, I think that um, in, in, for that reason, I think that as a stimulus, infrastructure is actually the wrong uh, policy to use because I think what's more important for Canada is talking about how to get people moving faster within urban centers and how to get our goods and services out of the country in terms of exporting or, or goods and services coming into the country in terms of importing, uh, because those are important for growth. And, and I think that those are much uh, longer term infrastructure projects uh, than what you're going to do in the very short run. Okay, thank you. Do I have time for another question? I think we need to go to Senator Eaton because the doctor has about four minutes left. We have Senator Eaton, then we have Senator Mockler who would like a little uh, question. I'll, I'll, I'll pick up on where Senator Marshall left off. Uh, talking about stimulus and infrastructure, um, what about pipelines? Uh, would they be a source if this government 
went and actually made the decision to do the east-west and perhaps uh, the northern gateway, would that be a long-term stimulus? Well, it, you know, I don't want to use the word stimulus, but a, a long-term long benefit to the country. Yeah, long-term project that you know would have creates jobs, long-term benefits for the country. Yeah. I, I think it's more than just pipelines. I, I think we need a more general discussion about how we're going to get infrastructure built in this country. Um, and it's but that's not just. All we seem to do is discuss. Right. And so think. one of the, one of the proposals that the School of Public Policy is working on with Cyrano in uh, in, in my, at the University of Montreal is the concept of developing corridors, and we call it the Northern Corridor, where you can move uh, whether it's minerals, forest products, uh, oil and gas, electrical transmission lines, uh, whatever, you get the pre-approval in place. Uh, for certain corridors, and then it becomes a much easier process oh, on I the see. regulatory side to get these things done more quickly. And if you look at the paper that we put out, we actually showed how you could do a corridor right across the north, um, you know, in a you know, you know, as a major as a major project that would connect. Uh, whether you're talking about Newfoundland uh, going all the way to BC, and 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 it's more than just pipelines. It is it is trying to get. Our goods and services out, and and, and port, and including ports and everything else. The the problem in Canada is that we don't have a process for for easy approval for regu for regula you know for a regulatory process to get easy approval for these things. And Australia has used this very effectively. So, for example, uh, Transalta has told me that uh, they they could do they could build an electrical transmission line uh, in uh, Australia and get all the approvals within six months. Well, it could take two years in Canada. Because the corridor has already been established. Exactly. And they're just going down the corridor. Exactly. Seems so sensible. It is. And, and African countries have been doing it. I've met a person in Toronto who's been doing this kind of work around the world. This is something that we could do in a, in a much more effective manner. Thank you. It's, it's interesting you bring that up, Doctor, because uh, our banking committee this morning, looking at future projects, uh, one of them is the Northern Corridor, and we have the article that you just uh, alluded to from University of Montreal. Are you okay, Senator Eaton? We can uh, move on. Yes, no, Senator Mockler, yes. to finish it off. Uh, in view of uh, the, uh, Senator Eaton's question, we um, uh, there's a lot of talk being put in the concept of distributing wealth. The um, Energy East pipeline, would we qualify that as a means of distributing wealth from coast to coast? <laughs> well, <laughs> so so the question is, what are the benefits that Canada gets as a whole from uh, Eastern pipeline versus um, uh, one particular region, things like that? Obviously, there's going to be uh, some, you know, Alberta, maybe. BC, but Alberta, and and potentially part of you know Saskatchewan, they may benefit because they can get oil sold uh, uh, more easily uh, and and shipped. Uh, but to me that, uh, and, but then when you're talking about the pipeline itself, it goes through communities. There's property taxes that are going to be paid. There's certain things that are going to be involved that will help those communities uh, as pro as well as provinces. And so uh, there are some economic benefits, and also we have to remember the taxes that are paid uh, from different regions in Canada that go to the federal government end up getting redistributed to other parts of the country. So yes, there are some positive uh, aspects to all parts of the country associated with that one project. But of course, you can make that point about many different projects and many different things we do. And this really, I think, goes back to the whole question of what we do as a country. What we we talk about innovation, uh, but actually part of innovation is, is, which means getting things done more efficiently, part of that is, is, a, is a regulatory system, uh, as well as how we are able to accomplish things to get them done. And, and I think that there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things that get covered, and if we want to grow better as a country, we should be doing that. I mean, the United States has been planting lots of pipelines right across the country. Uh, they've been developing their uh, resources. Uh, they've had some opposition in certain parts of the country in the United States uh, to, to development. Um, but they're going ahead, aren't they, with things like LNG plants and stuff like that. 
we're still waiting to get our final approval on an LNG plant in, uh, on the West Coast. Doctor, would you like to give us a, sort of a 30 second to 60 second summary of what key message do you want to leave with us today? I think we need a better plan for growth in this country. I think we need to get more focused on growth because in the end, with our aging society and our productivity problems, uh, if we're going to have the resources to redistribute to help low-income people in poverty, which I think all of us around this table would agree, or we need, you know, we would like to support individuals that need that support. Uh, we're going to need the growth and the income uh, to do that, and the tax revenues that evolve uh, for governments to play their role. You uh, note said one thing that uh, picked up on is the. Developing our, our or streamlining our regulatory system is one of the key steps. Is is that a point that's strong yes. in your? Yeah, it, okay. it's, it applies to all sorts of policies and governments. We need to be more focused on more uh, on a growth-oriented path than we're seeing right now. And uh, did you have a chance to see the uh, banking study that we just announced on the uh, interprovincial trade? I got a copy of it, but I've been traveling. Oh, so I know you've been with your and grandchildren. It's actually it's you'll a, have a chance to read it. Maybe you know, on the plane. I'll, I'll be I'll be planning to read that because I actually uh, have that so I can great uh, copy because I am interested in reading that. Well, on behalf of our committee, we thank you very much, sir, to, for taking the time to spend with us today and to share your thoughts on the implications of Budget 2016. We'll uh, suspend for a few minutes and wait for our next witnesses. Thank you.